Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 41, we continue our Green Army Abroad series and we chat to professional basketball player and Irish international Sean Flood. On this episode, we delve deep into Sean's career, his secrets to success, habits, routines and so much more. If you're interested in playing higher level basketball, you will love this episode. Hi Sean, thanks a million for coming on the podcast. No worries, thanks for having me Orla. So before we get into everything, I can you give a bit of background about yourself for the listeners who might not know who you are? Yeah, so uh, my name's Sean Flood, I'm 24 from Dublin, a uh, professional basketball player and spent some time, four years over in college uh, in the States playing basketball as well. Brilliant, so we're going to go back to growing up, you mentioned you're from Dublin, uh, what got you into basketball and take us through some of your early years? Um, so my mom got me into basketball. My mom is heavily invo- involved in basketball, especially at uh, area board level. She's uh, currently on the Dublin Men's Basketball Board and also sits on one of, I don't know, one of the many Basketball Ireland committees. So, um, yeah, growing up, she was obviously really into it. So I just kind of took off from there. Football was my first sport growing up. And, uh, yeah, playing football and basketball. But then I think when it got down to decision time, basketball definitely took uh, took the forefront there. So. Yeah, it's, it's great so to have such a connection as well. Something my mom loves as well. It's great. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What age were you when you took when you kind of decided there? I'm going to take basketball seriously and kind of focus on that. Uh, gee, it was junior search year, so what's that? Probably fourteen at the thirteen, yeah. fourteen, fifteen, sometime around then. Which okay. is like there's there's pictures of me up in the basketball arena. I think uh, I don't know four four countries tournament. There's something back when I was only one. I'd say that's probably. <laughs> Uh, from when the love started, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was the, what was the kind of, what kind of prompted you to really focus on basketball? Was it your connection with your mom? As you said, there you were watching games since you were one. What, what stood out compared to for football, really? Um, probably that I was just a bit better at it, to be honest okay. with you. And also, uh, I just remember sitting down watching telly around Christmas time one time, and uh, I was watching college basketball on telly. Texas were playing. And I just saw the whole spectacle of it all and just kind of was drawn into that. And I was like, oh, geez, that'd be something I'd love to do if I was given the opportunity. And yeah. obviously, hard work goes into that. So you know, if I worked hard enough, that hopefully that opportunity would arise. And I think that just kind of took off from there. So you were drawn towards the lights and cameras, were you? <laughs> yeah, just the whole Erasmus glitz and glam for all was just spectacular. I was like, it just kind of took me in. I was like, I'll tell you what, if I, could, if I could do that for a little bit, I wouldn't mind. So yeah, I think... Obviously, watching football on a Saturday, I don't think I was ever going to play for Manchester United, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no matter how hard I worked, so uh, I think that was the best, the next best option. Very good. And what kind of like training preparation wise? You're obviously a professional now. You play for the Irish and your men's team. But how do you bridge that gap? And starting from, like I presume around 15 is when you took it really seriously. So you started to put in a lot of extra work, maybe outside a club or Ireland or development panel training. Yeah, so obviously coaches play a huge role in that and just kind of showing you what needs to be done in order to kind of bridge them gaps, take the next step. But obviously there's steps as you go. So underage, you want to make a Dublin team, then you want to make a Lancer team, then you want to probably obviously make an Irish team. So it all progresses from there. So when I was given the opportunity to kind of go forward and look to make Irish teams, that's when I really kind of knuckled down and took it seriously and kind of got after coaches to say, listen, hey, show me what needs to be done. Uh, for me to go on and make these teams then it just progresses from there 16s, 18s and then under 20s into the men's situation then so it's it's all kind of little stepping stones you have to reach along the way to get to obviously the men's team I love the way there you mentioned reaching out to a coach or let's say maybe a teammate or someone if someone's listening maybe they've reached out to someone other than a coach but why do you think you reached out to someone to find out what you could work on because something I'm realizing I didn't do that when I was younger and I'm coaching Gaelic football now and I'm constantly telling the girls I'm like ask me something I'm not going to bite your head off I actually want you to ask me so why do you think you had the maturity to kind of ask coaches to say well what do I need to work on here? Well, questions are, questions are good. You can obviously always learning or always wanting to learn. I think that's how you kind of progress as a player, as a person as well. So also, if, you, if you've if you seen someone who has been there before, 
and kind of done that and you want to kind of say listen I want to get there this and you, know, you put your ego aside as a kid or whatever so it's obviously difficult at times as a kid saying oh that's what you mean someone else knows better than me he's being stubborn mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, if you can kind of put that to a side you're, you're going to learn and uh, yeah it's, it's good for you progress progress your team progress your teammates and obviously pro- progress others coming behind you I've had plenty of people kind of ask me reach out to me what do I need to do to, to get to the next level and it's just kind of helping everyone else along the way so take that first step and reach out to someone be a coach teammate someone on another team someone you just look up to so yeah very good you mentioned in an interview before about advice to younger players and one of the biggest ones was be consistent in how you work and build good habits can you explain that one a little bit yeah so like um, you to obviously be consistent with things like you, you can work hard today and then take six, seven days off, a week off and the next thing, work hard again you're not going to get very far you need to work hard and then build on from your hard work from to, let's say today, yesterday, create a habit from it until just working hard is second nature and it's just alright I'm going to get up today, I'm going to get done what needs to get done and you put like different patterns together in times different skill sets over time and you can just progress from basic to more advanced things so if you like anything if you just start a little little bit of time you're gonna kind of your skill level is going to diminish whereas if you could just keep that sharp and keep adding on to it the tools will just get sharper and you go from there would you have any sort of non-negotiable daily or weekly habits that you go through <laughs> yeah so i'm 24 but i feel like i'm 54 <laughs> So there's a lot of preparation and getting ready, like different mobility stuff that I have to do to just be able to get up and down the court, be able to yeah. move side to side. Um, so yeah, there's, I'd say there's probably five different exercises I do, uh, mobility-wise, stretching-wise, every single day, two, three times a day, just to ensure that I'm ready to go. Like, wow, when did you start doing them? Uh, not, 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 uh, not when I was young enough, anyway. Uh, probably... <laughs> I'd say when when COVID hit, it's kind of when I became more aware of, like I was always aware of I had tight hips, I had tight hamstrings, quads, whatever. But yeah. from, I think COVID was nearly, not a blessing in disguise, but it kind of gave me time to reflect and really dig deep and look into different methods of what needs to be done. Uh, obviously, traditional stretching is one thing, but I found no matter how much I stretched, it uh, wasn't working for me. So COVID kind of gave me the time. I think everyone was a little more, bit more active on Instagram and all of a sudden these things started popping up. And uh, I'd say that's when I kind of took it, not that I wasn't taking it serious beforehand, but kind of yeah. was taking it serious as to what actually needs to be done as opposed to what you think might need to be done. Okay, very good. Yeah, I'm similar to you. I like just the stretching isn't enough for me. So I started doing mobility over lockdown as well. And like, it's a lot of work, particularly at the beginning. I don't know if you were the same, but it took me a couple of weeks. But after like four weeks, oh my God, I felt so loose. It was amazing. Like That's it. It's like obviously building up strength in, in the areas of weakness. People kind of often will mistake tightness for like it being tight, where really it could be a lack of strength in a, in a certain area, muscle or joint area. So um, yeah, it just it's difficult at the start, but the more you get used to it, and as you were saying, it's a non-negotiable, the more you start tipping away at it, the, the better and easier it comes exactly you mentioned as well in that interview i think it was the basketball Ireland one i'll link it below if i can find it but you mentioned having a specific and detailed plan particularly for younger players is that something you had growing up um yeah i was lucky enough to have coaches that were kind of detailed things out for me and to kind of put me in a situation to be like right this is what we're doing today then we move to this and progress through the stage like anyone can go out and work hard you can work hard at the wrong thing but if you have a plan, right, I want to be good at this today, I'm going to work at this for so many t- so many hours, minutes, whatever, and then progress and then con- continually do that. And like, see, you know what the end goal is, have little baby steps to get to it rather than say, oh, well, I want to do, I, I'm starting here, I want to get to there, but not knowing the steps that you need to to get to there. And um, I think that's kind of kind of what I meant in that. Okay, and do you still have your own plans? I presume you're doing them yourself now, kind of from an individual point as a professional. Yeah, so like I have my habits I do every time I go into the gym. Mobility stuff I try to get done before I get to the gym to make the most of our own court time. Then I'll get into the gym and do small things like I have to form shoot. As mad as it sounds, I have to start every every day. Anytime I go on the court, I have to make a little left-hand move before I do anything. Just like a little okay. touch off the glass 
before I start form shooting. So I make a quick little left hand layup. I'll make I think it's I'll make about sixty shots before I'd I'd move outside the paint. So I make ten, then take a step back, ten, make a step back, ten, make a step back. Sorry, fifty in the paint, then ten free throws. And then I can kind of go on from there. But I have different different things I'd progress to then on a game day as opposed to a practice day. On a practice day I might just start getting loose, getting up and down a little bit. Um but then game days it's obviously a lot more locked in and more regimented as to where I have to go from after my form shooting. Okay, like the basketball Ireland video, I think you're doing around the world with a basketball, shoot the three, get the other basketball, flick it up and shoot another three. Yeah. It's like a soccer move. <laughs> yeah, now that's that's kind of combining combining my two loves in sports. But yeah, that's that'll be kind of more of an example of something you're just kind of doing on a practice day. Wouldn't really yeah. be seen doing that on a game day. But like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they lose, have a bit of fun in practice, it's all good. How important is having fun when practicing? Because I suppose that's something maybe as a professional or really anyone, if you're practicing as consistently as it sounds what you're doing, the fun element can sometimes be taken out of it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why we all started playing basketball or, or given sports. Like, it was fun. We thought we really loved it and enjoyed it as a kid. So to have that joy is hugely important, especially if it's something we're doing three and a half hours, four hours a day. If you're going, it's like going into work. If you're going in grim every day, you're not really going to get the most out of it. But if you can get in there, obviously you're getting in to compete and work hard. But if you can enjoy it and kind of find fun in doing that, it just makes it so much better. And you start playing better too. You're you're looser. You're enjoying it. Have a smile on your face, and it's it's contagious then as well. If others if others can join in, I'm not, I'm not going to say the fun, but I'd say the enjoyment of it. Okay. Do you find you enjoy it more when there's a ball involved, or if it's like competitive? Um, competitive with a ball as opposed to just sprinting. I'm a basketball player. I'm not a runner. I yeah, hate yeah, running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you picked you picked forward as well. Just funny thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, hey, running and jumping, but I I picked basketball. So that's a bit gas. <laughs> kind of talking about Irish teams and kind of being involved in a high performance environment. At what stage did you look at going to the states and kind of going beyond Ireland? Um, yeah, that, as I said, around that Christmas time, I'd say I was eleven. I looked at it, I was like, oh, geez, this is something that's fantastic. But then I'd say seriously, when I thought I might have had a chance, it was probably when I was like 15, 16. Like, okay. right, well, now it's like, now it's something that is, it's it's approaching. Like, I'm in secondary school here. I need to start thinking of, like, what I want to do. Everyone's thinking of what they want to put on their CAO, or a CAO, I think it is, um, for what college they want to go to, what college course. It was no different for me, except my planning process probably had to start the year before that. As to okay where I want to go and kind of who do I start reaching out to. Okay. And did you start to reach out to kind of high schools and prep schools at that time? Um, initially, I reached out to a couple of high school, or yeah, prep schools, more so than high schools. Um, reach out to some prep schools through the help of others as well. Like um, Paul Cummins is a big help in that. Puff Summers is a big help in that too. So like with their help, reached out to prep schools and went from there, but it wasn't really going to work out with prep. So that's when I kind of was like, right, well, we'll have to look at JUCOs and then different universities as well. So that's when I kind of got emailing different uh, Division Ones and different JUCOs myself to, like, with their help as to what to say and who exactly to reach out. Obviously, there's no point in reaching out to the likes of Duke, Kentucky, UNC. Yeah, yeah. There, it's, like, it's just daft, really. Wasting yeah. your time, wasting their time. But um, yeah, so you just have to target your target your area and just go for that in that way. And you spent a year in Germany around six year, was it? Yeah, so instead of doing traditional six year in Ireland, I left in September and went and done six year in Germany. Played in a town called Ludwigsburg. They had a, a top league team, very good top league team now actually in the Bundesliga in Germany. Okay. So I spent time there for a year playing with their academy team and practicing every so often with their first team. And then once our season was over, came back home and started back into Temple Oak College um, for the last, I think, month and a half before then sitting the Leaving Cert. And how did that work academically? Did they have the Leaving Cert curriculum over there? or? Um, so they had like different individual teachers. So they, they had people come in, teach me business, teach me economics. So like one of the boys on the first team, his wife had graduated with a business and economics degree. So okay. basically she was my business and economics teacher. Then they had to source someone to be my Spanish teacher, source someone to kind of cover the English curriculum with me. 
Um, obviously, all the time I'm reaching back out to my teachers back home in Ireland through email. They were very helpful with that, uh, agreeing to it as well, having no problem with me just shooting them off an email and then um, sending me back things. But then had to teach myself Irish and probably wouldn't be the best at mm-hmm. Irish, even in a, in a classroom. But I was able to squeeze a C3 out of it and leave and so I was delighted with that. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. And what's that like before heading to Germany and explaining to your friends and your teachers, look, I'm going to go to Germany and play in a basketball academy. Like, I'm sure your close friends are like, oh, yeah, that's grand. Or like people that know you, like, oh, that's Sean, the basketball player. But what's that conversation like? Are they like, what are you doing? Or are they just really understanding? Uh, I'd say, yeah, understanding because they knew my love for the game. But probably it's like a bit of a weird time and it's it's yeah. a six year very important school year so uh, I'd say the time of probably true true people definitely was a big discussion with my family within my family obviously um it was a big part of well you have to you have to do your leaving cert is this going to be the right thing to do um are you definitely going to do the leaving cert all that kind of stuff and then Temple Oak College my my secondary school played a huge part in it too and actually allow me leave but keep my place in the school okay. for when I came back that I could slot in rather than take in let's say another student who was on the waiting list they were more than happy for me to do that and yeah obviously it was kind of strange for my teachers my teachers kind of looked at me funny when I when I brought the idea to them yeah. but um were very helpful throughout the course of the year as well just um staying on top of me staying on top of emails and stuff like that with me very good and what's it like basketball wise when you go to Germany is it a shock is it a, I suppose when you're playing for Ireland you're you're going to other countries and you see kind of different basketball styles and in different countries but what's it like going over there and training in an academy and as you said they're training a couple of times with their first team yeah you see the level you see the difference in the level like obviously uh, basketball in Ireland is definitely uh, progressing getting a lot better but Germany has had been making that jump and they've been progressing a lot earlier so you're you're in a situation where there's a lot of good players around you it's, it's a lot more serious nearly professional when you're 18 like you're you're uh, practicing every day you'll have maybe sometimes uh, probably twice a week you'd have a lift and then you would have video before practice video of games scout and stuff like that and then it's just it's just a different level every single day five days a week you're on with um a game at the weekend maybe two games because you're playing, I was playing with the academy team, and then that academy team also was playing in the men's league. So, okay. um, yeah, it's very full on. It's it's very different to Ireland. Obviously, back home you might have your one session a week, and then a game at the weekend. Or if you're playing up onto a second team, you'll have two sessions, and then uh, two games or a game at the weekend. But um, yeah, it's just kind of the consistency that goes back to the consistency part of it. And that's why I think countries are good at uh, sports. They're good for a reason. It's not a mistake. They're there every day. They're working hard every day as opposed to once, twice a week. You can't really form and build good habits Mm -hmm. just once, twice a week. That's something that needs to be taken care of team-wise five days a week when possible. Yeah, I know what you mean. You spoke about it on the Hoopfolio podcast, which I'll link below. Um, I think one of the guys you had got in touch with is someone or there was someone involved with the team and you you called him a, a pro's pro. Can you describe that for the likes of myself or someone listening that doesn't know what it takes to be a professional and to be what you said, a pro's pro. So he must have been fairly elite at what he was doing both on and off the court. Yeah, it's just the discipline that goes into it every day. Like Obviously, it's it's very easy to show up and play basketball what what's done off the court, diet-wise, taking care of your body, even when you show up, showing up early, maybe staying a little bit late, like training starts, let's say, 5 o'clock, it's not showing up 10 to 5, it's being there maybe uh, 45 minutes early, getting your work done, getting a bit of a sweat going before you even step on the court, so that you're actually ready as soon as training starts, as opposed to warming up to it as it goes, and kind of 25, half an hour in, you're getting used to to the pace of practice where you can kind of set that tone and, and be that guy from the start. I'd say that's probably what I would describe as a pro's pro, knowing, knowing what it takes on off the court and just being able to show up and give give a good, consistent performance every day. Okay, brilliant. Was there anything else in Germany that you picked up on, whether it was a team or playing against other players or, as you said, just realising the level of talent over there? Uh, different tactical stuff as well. Um, obviously, a lot more uh, stuff is is drilled when you have a lot more time together. Five days a week, five nights a week, 
you can go deeper in tactical things, tactical tactical situations. So I'd say I picked up a lot of tactical knowledge, um, probably more advanced than a lot of 18 year olds in Ireland at the time, just because you're exposed to that level of basketball. Um, like the BBL in Germany is a really, really high level of basketball, especially now it's really trending upwards. Um, so being exposed to that and around coaches who are doing a full time at the job. So instead of sitting in an office, let's say in Dublin or wherever in Ireland, thinking about accounting or whatever, they're sitting in an office thinking basketball, looking looking things up, like constantly basketball on their mind. So yeah, mm-hmm. tactically wise, I'd say that's where I kind of probably took it took a good step forward. Did you adapt to it straight away, or did it take a lot of time where you to take your own time really? off the court and kind of study it all or did you find you picked it up you picked it up a bit quick um i'd like to think i picked it up fairly quick like I, i'd like to think i'm a quick learner especially when it comes to the basketball it's mm-hmm. something i love it's something like honestly I, I think about these tactical things all the time like even even now like but as an 18 year old i think um yeah it's something i probably i'd like to think i picked up quick enough anyway probably have to ask my coach he probably could yeah. have a different answer for you <laughs> and do you find video work is a big element of like for example would you watch obviously you obviously watch basketball but would you really study film yeah I know you probably would have in college but do you find now like just in your off time you said there you think about the tactical side do you really study film a lot oh yeah it's huge it's such such an important part of the game and I think anyone who says says differently um is probably very wrong like even there during the European Championships we play our game seven o'clock probably get home have dinner back up in the room about 10 o'clock and then I'd like to sit down and either watch the first quarter on the phone or watch the first quarter with Adrian who was my roommate and like we'd be nitpicking at things and like rather than just watching it to watch the game you're kind of watching it we're blown out teams but it's like what can we do better to kind of increase or when we're playing at a higher level now against better competition like what will we not get away with what can we do better um, to kind of give ourselves an advantage but um, yeah no video is it's huge it's such an important part of the game stay learning like know your weaknesses and push on from there I'd say and if there's any younger players listening what advice would you give them about watching film I know some people they're great for for watching the highlights and watching all the dunks but what advice would you give them yeah so study study what your coaches are saying so like a lot of a lot of teams will like work on different drop down drills and someone someone gets beat off the dribble for someone to get over and help get two feet outside the paint and for the guy to drop down or whatever. Like just look out for different rotations like that defensively in games. Um and just be able to to see it. Like see what your coaches are talking about. If if that's something you work on, see that if it's a different pick and roll coverage and the uh, like the last man is playing a certain way. Like understand oh this is what my coach is talking about. So you can see it, see what it looks like, see what it looks like when it's done well. And then even if they do it poorly, say, oh, well, this could have been done differently if X, Y, Z, if he'd done whatever. So, um, yeah, like look out for what your coaches talk about and try and, and be able to identify it at a high level. Brilliant. So you came back, you did your month in secondary school and you sat the leave insert. That summer, what was the plan? Uh, I think, did you say another year in Ireland before America? Yeah, so I, I took a gap year in between college and um, basically I deferred my CEO course in okay. DIT so I always had that like after coming out of leave and obviously um, got my my CEO course place in DIT I think it was for marketing or business management one year or two and um, so yeah deferred that for a year and that's when I kind of really started heavily emailing coaches and reaching out that year I was playing with Temple Og in the Super League we had a great team and like we had a lot of success that year winning the cup and everything so like I was playing high level basketball with some really really good players and like competing with them boys twice a week and then being able to go out and play was was huge huge point like huge learning for me as well like I was only a young lad on a team with the likes of Jay uh Jay Killeen Connor Grace Boney, like all these boys, Paul, Cullen, like it was just the list went on of like the older, more experienced players. And then you had the younger lads, like, well, young at the time, like Steve, Lorco, all these boys as well. So we had a good mix and there was a lot of learning for me done that year as kind of the young lad, as the point guard. So like it was, it was good, good part of development for me that year uh, to kind of set me up for the States then the next year. Out of interest, what did you learn that year off the experienced lads that you just named? Um, I'd say 
I, lot, I learned a lot from Connor Grace and just kind of what it takes uh, day to day in practice. Like if one thing I remember, I got I got a dead leg one training session, and like everyone, you get a dead leg, you sit out for a second. But uh, Connor stopped the training and wasn't having any of it. He was like, "No, he's like, is, he's like, is it gonna get worse if you run?" I was like, "No, it's a dead leg." He's like, "Okay, well, if if you're in college, if it's not gonna get worse, you're not getting out of a drill." And it made me stay in. So it's a kind of the toughness level of what what you need to push through to endure for that next step is something I really learned from Connor that year. Brilliant. And I think you mentioned before in the Hoop Photo podcast. The three lads sat you down or something before you went to America? Oh, yeah, they were great. Um, Connor, Paul and Jay took me to Bunsen Burger in town <laughs> to just kind of sit down and like, give me the expectations of what it's like going into college, um, what to expect on and off the court as college lifestyle, as a basketball player over there, as an Irish basketball player over there, and just how to kind of combat different deficiencies we may have as, a, as athletes as an athlete compared to other athletes and just yeah just wish me luck and really kind of set me up for what I was to expect okay brilliant that sounds fantastic like learning from those with experience like those lads would have been over there um you went to Santa Fe College junior college um talk us through why Santa Fe and what were the other offers because I think at one stage you were chatting to I could be wrong but uh Loyola Marymount, where Eli Maryland, Scott went? In Maryland, sorry. Maryland, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened was I was chatting to one of their assistant coaches a good bit, and the way my leaving cert results worked, like obviously taking higher and ordinary level is a lot more difficult taking higher level than ordinary level. So it's that mainly higher level. I think I might have set one, I set two ordinary level subjects. And um, they saw like C's as a poor grade, I support like a poor thing oh, way okay. to score on a test. So the NCAA like eligibility center were going to like deem me academically ineligible because they didn't notice the difference in the difficulty levels of classes. So the what I'd compare it to is like taking AP classes in high school. They're like more college advanced classes you can take in high school, which are scored differently. Um so basically I took higher level like most people would and ended up put myself in a bad situation uh, in terms of college in America, getting C's in higher level as a, like opposed to getting a C here uh, yeah. back in Ireland. If you get a C, it's a better result to get than sitting on ordinary level and getting an A. So kind of was in a bit of trouble with that. So um, he reached out to Coach Mary down in Santa Fe, reached out to a, another Juco in Philadelphia, I believe as well, and um, worked out best with Coach Mary down in Santa Fe got on the phone when I was actually on holidays um, when I started initially communicating with Coach Mary trying to enjoy myself and this all popped up so kind of oh, happened no. very very quickly it probably happened start of August and I had to be over there and August start of September so yeah it happened very quickly but very very thankful that it happened Wouldn't, like honestly looking back now on my journey through college I am so so happy that it worked out that way that I went to Juco first, then on to Longwood. I just think as a person it helped me develop and um, see a new part of the world. And yeah, that no, was fantastic. I was delighted it worked out that way, which is kind of a mad thing to say now in the end. Yeah, and that's interesting because I know some people listening who don't know college basketball that well might not turn their nose up against like for junior college, but they don't realise the level and the lads who were there. Like I spoke to Ryan Leonard and he was saying he went to Santa Fe obviously and he was saying guys are there for academic reasons like yourself or maybe they got in trouble or just something went dead was out of their controls so they had to go to junior college but it's not like and no one Nelson mentioned this like there's some of the top players in the country like it's not like, oh yeah a bunch of scrubs like do you know yeah no absolutely like and that's it like people are there for different situations some people um as may have been academic academically ineligible um may have said listen in a division one said we don't like how you shoot we don't think you shoot well enough go to a juco for a year or two uh work on that and we'll pick you up from there and then yeah some people just transferred maybe where they were in terms of a division one or a division two they weren't happy with they wanted to change the situation so after their freshman year they go to a juco for a year and then can push on from there like a lot of people do it's something to be ashamed of the transfer portal these days now is insane so yeah. um yeah a lot like a lot of people will be 
excuse me, sorry, using Juco as an option. And it's a very kind of good option. It, it um really good basketball, really good people. And I think Juco um is kind of a different bit of a struggle sometimes. And like the friends you make there are more than likely gonna be friends you're gonna have like genuinely for a lifetime. Like I on on FaceTime last night to one of my best pals from Santa Fe, sitting on FaceTime with him for an hour, like I talk to him as often as I can. I definitely once a week on FaceTime just chatting away, like so that's someone I'd, I'll never lose contact with, no doubt. As you said, they're probably a different friendship because you've gone through a different experience that not a lot of people can relate to. Like, certainly I can't relate to that experience or maybe someone who went to college basketball, like sort of NCAA, wouldn't relate to what you guys went through. No, every, like everyone's there to get out. Like, you, it's it's a very difficult job, I'm sure, coaching Juco basketball because everyone's there knowing this isn't where they ultimately want to be. They want to be there for a year in some cases two years like most cases to then progress on so you can have a lot of selfish basketball trying to put myself out there and nearly trying to outdo your teammates because essentially you're you're on the same team but you're, you're competing for a spot at the next level um together and could be the coach walks into the gym i'm looking for a guard and there's there's two really good guards well who, who's your better guard so like yeah, it's 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 definitely definitely something that kind of brings you together, like being there, but now and ultimately you don't want to be there. Yeah, as you said there, like that's when you have a coach walk in like that and he wants to pick someone and you're basically yeah, your teammates and your friends, but you're competing for college spots. What's that like and kinda of, does it open your eyes to kinda of like this is really a business and we're really sort of interchangeable, like there's a couple of hundred people that are in my position that want this place. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, the coach are professional over there. It's, it absolutely is a business. If you're not getting the job done, uh, they're the ones that get fired. Yeah, yeah, they're the ones that get fired, and like then they can't feed their kids, and then that's a problem. So they want to they want to hold you to a high high standard, high expectation, and then like you're competing against your friends, which is like you wouldn't have it any other way. Like I've I've seen two best like best friends fight, at trying to like actually fight. <laughs> because of how competitive it got, but not like everyone understands what it like. It's it's not they don't hate each other. It's not. It's literally yeah. just competitive. They know like what it what it takes. Like and like college is so expensive over there. Like it, yeah. it's, it's me or you. Like it, it's gonna be me. Like so, you have to understand that how hard and how badly people want it. Yeah. And like if it, if it's not for scholarships, a lot of people can't actually go to college. So yeah, it, it's it's very important. Obviously, when you're competing against your friends, it's a it's a good aspect. I was listening to Paul McGinley on the High Performance Podcast recently and he was speaking about um, kids having a plan A and a plan B. And you mentioned they're having a place in DIT and deferring that, that place. Like he was talking to a coach and in America, I think it was Minnesota, and he wanted a kid that just loved golf. And that was it. They were going to play golf and they had no plan B. And his argument was if a kid had wanted to play golf but had a plan B, I think he was talking about his own experience, he went to college, that it allows the kid to be more free and perform without that pressure. Do you feel that having the backup plan of DIT and coming back to Ireland allowed you and didn't put maybe so much pressure on you compared to maybe some of the American kids that knew like this is my one shot at college? Um, I would say no because I I just would have been so unhappy. I would okay. like it would have I would have been miserable and honestly I don't know whether if I would have like I would have finished college back home yeah. but I would have struggled through it I would have hated every minute of it okay. and like it wouldn't have been good like it wouldn't have been good for me whereas over a year kind of submersed in it's a different world college in okay. America like everyone is living in their own apartments um like you've, you there's no parents around not that that's a bad thing or anything yeah. like <laughs> yeah, if that yeah. if that if that freedom that you just don't have in in Ireland for college, especially in Dublin. Like being from Dublin, I would have been living at home. All my mates are living at home. Like it's just completely different. So like I would have, I know for a fact I would have been so unhappy. Even just how kind of college works back in Ireland as opposed to America, I would have, I would have been miserable. So I wouldn't say it was a, a like a safety net for me. Like it was that was not Plan B. That was Plan Z. Like that was last resort. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to college in Ireland. I I really really didn't want to go there. And is that what got you through? Let's say a really tough practice or 
a tough day whether you didn't you didn't play well or something wasn't going your way you're like I want to be here and I really don't want to go I don't like I want to go to, I want to be in college in America and I don't want to have to go home yeah like definitely like even the even before the year the gap year I took before I went like I'd be up I, I don't want to go and work out I don't want to go to the gym but at the end of the day like, like this is it's going to be what it takes like it's it's a short-term sacrifice for a long-term like lifestyle and something that I really want to do so you don't mind making them short-term sacrifices but then once you're over there as well like it was tough my my freshman year was very difficult like just kind of adapting to basketball over there it's a different lifestyle different game basketball wise as well like it's it's completely different so like I had a tough time and like I was like well I'd rather I'd rather have a tough time here living the way I'm living as opposed to being back home like I know for a fact a, a cold November I'm just like this is not what I want I'd rather have a have a November over there where you're kind of surrounded by your teammates and then your new pals and all your new like kind of your mates you, you've you've created over there it's just it's just a better lifestyle I reckon and for me you, anyway for my yeah. personality yeah it's different for everyone did you, especially with maybe the year in Germany and at junior college did you struggle with homesickness at all was that something that kind of played into it all well, as you said mentioned previously this was a dream for so long so maybe that didn't for you yeah uh, no I, I actually didn't really struggle with homesickness at all like uh, there was times it was very difficult and you'd like you want to oh, just, I just want to go home and have a home cooked meal see my mom and dad but I don't think for an extended period of time I would ever like say I was homesick like okay. there's, there's obviously there's days you're like oh jeez I'm not in the mood for this year someone, someone will say something to you like everyone, you have a bad day, but um, the difference is you have a bad day, you, you don't have your mum or dad there to pick you up, but like yeah. you can just, like it's so easy nowadays, you can just FaceTime them, so it's grand, but yeah, like it's, it's um, no, I don't think I was ever homesick for an extended period of time. Okay, okay, yeah, and how did you find the summer after your first year at junior college, was there, you said you struggled there adapting, was there anything that you did during the summer, I presume you, from listening to you, even incredible work work ethic, was there anything you really worked on that summer to prepare yourself for the second year? Um, yeah, so I'd say like, I cha- m- mentality was, I'd say that's something that I, I changed, um, it was gone over there, it was a shock, like basketball was the same everywhere but different everywhere as well so um it wasn't the style of basketball that i was used to from back home in ireland or even in germany like the irish game and the german game were a lot closer um just kind of structural was than the game in america especially in juco so um it's not something that i was used to not not that i fought against it my freshman year but it's definitely something that i was just not on unha- yeah I suppose unhappy with I wasn't happy in how how we were playing and like the style of basketball so I'd say when I got home that summer um after my freshman year and then going into my sophomore year my mentality changed and just worked on what needed to be done to have success in in that system that style of play as opposed to what I had what I'd always done so yeah it was it was an adjustment but I'd say it was more of a mentality shift and just kind of accepting that you're there um, be present over there and uh, yeah I'd say that's what it was mentality change more so than that and changing your mentality is that just sitting down with yourself and just having nearly a conversation with yourself and th- what I'm getting from what you just said there was nearly having to put your ego aside and say look Sean you're not going to get anywhere doing what you're used to doing you have to now fit into a new system one you might not agree with the entire time but if you want to get to where you want to go you're going to have to change yeah no definitely um put the ego aside yeah like I didn't I don't think I have a big massive ego but like I, I like to think that I'm I'm decent at what I do so um yeah you had to, had to put that aside and just kind of say right listen he's he's the boss he like he's not changing for a small little Irish guard coming over why would he yeah he's been doing it he was doing it years especially at Santa Fe like coach Mary is has won everything there is to be won in Florida Duke of basketball so like he's not going to change for me um and nor should he so it was just, yeah, kind of fit in, adapt, sit down, just be re- be real with yourself and kind of understand, well, listen, it's either change or go through the same year you've just had. And uh, that wasn't really an option for me, not something that I wanted to do, nor could I afford to do again. So, yeah, just sat yourself down, accept it for what it is and keep it pushing. You mentioned there he's not going to change anything for a small little Irish card. What's it like going over to the States and when people say, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ireland. And then having that kind of realizing well 
I'm the, probably the only Irish person they might have met so far. And if I'm playing basketball, they're going to think of me every time they meet the next Irish basketball player. Did you ever feel pressure being like, not that you're representing the nation, but you have to keep up a standard. So, and what I'm, I'm explaining this badly, but when you're over there, like what I see from all the younger kids going over is sometimes they go to a college that there was an Irish person at before. Did you ever feel pressure that I need to perform here and be of a good standard and live up to expectations? Because if I don't, they won't look at the next Irish kid. Um, yeah, like you want to, especially the, the path that I took, no one had ever gone to a Juco. So I wanted to kind of leave there being like, okay, we'll be comfortable enough taking another Irish lad okay. to come play in Juco. I didn't want to be the first guy over there and say, like, Jesus Christ, we don't want to take another Irish lad here. Yeah. And like, it was it was a great situation. I left and Ryan then came in after me. Yeah. So like, it that kind of let me know that I'd done my job. I'd kind of given a good representation of Irish basketball. Um, in the junior college ranks that coach was happy enough to say right well listen I trusted Sean now I can now going forward I can trust Ryan like coach Mary came to me and was like well I, like Ryan Landers on to me or I think it was Rick his dad was on to me and um, can Ryan play here and I was like yeah absolutely like I was like Ryan's a good basketball player so like he's like what what like he was trying to ask me for a player comp so like who would he be like because like he's not like anyone we have here he's different body type he's more like basketball wise like him but body type like someone else and yeah like he, like now he's like will he work hard and like he, he's that mentality as himself like he's coming here for a reason like no one no one's going to go all the way over there to play junior college basketball or basketball at any level if you're not going to work hard and be committed to it mm-hmm. so yeah it kind of let me know that I had, I had done my job but I don't ever think it was a pressure I think it was more just kind of I wanted like I'm a, I'm a proud person I want to give a good representation of myself and then also at the same time give a good representation of Irish basketball I get the impression from chatting to you you're really competitive but at the same time you're really calm do you ever feel under pressure? Uh, pressure is a privilege love it so yeah pressure happens but like yeah I would like to think that I'm a calm individual just kind of take everything as it comes like life's not going to be perfect it hasn't been up to this point it won't be going forward so yeah I just kind of take everything as it comes um, but yeah there's definitely some high pressure situations that you think you find yourself in be it on the basketball court they're just everyday life like it just just kind of comes and goes Would you get nervous before a game? Oh no never Really? Your your preparation your preparation's done before a game, gone into a game. It's it's kind of times up now. Like you you've either done your work or you haven't done your work. Like you're not gonna fill anyone else when you get out there. Like you, there's no point. So yeah. you've you've done your work. If you've like I think it's Jordan said like your work ethic reduces. I don't know. Something like basically takes away the the nervousness or anything. If you're confident going into the game, you're happy enough with the work you've done and your preparation will then. You go from there, so no, I don't think I've ever been nervous. Well, I've been nervous before a game in the past, like growing up, but now I don't get nervous now. I get the sense that's from, as you said, from the preparation. You know you've done everything you possibly can, so there's no reason why you should be nervous. Yeah, it's, it's, I'd say it's excitement. Like, you just can't wait to get out there. Every every game, like, especially starting the new, like, starting a new season here, starting the European Championships there during the summer, uh, even playing Slovakia. It's it's a new challenge. You don't know what it's going to come, but it's not nervous. It's more excitement. Like, well, I've done my work. Everyone else I know has it's, it's put in their work. They've been doing it with me. So, um, like, let's let's see whose work is going to pay off. Is it ours or theirs? Yeah, exactly. So it's an excitement level to it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, talk us through that second year then at, at Duco. So you changed your mentality. You came in in that September. Talk us through that year and how that whole experience went in the second year. Because I get the sense that it was probably a little more positive than the first year there. Oh, absolutely. Had had an unbelievable year on and off the court. Um, like my friends were, were great. Um, off the court, like we we like my as a team we were really a good group together. Like we'd spend a lot of time together, even just playing PlayStation or the boys who didn't play PlayStation, you're just there kind of having a chat and just being involved and everything. So yeah, it was it was great. Um, and on basketball on the court went a lot smoother for me as well. Um up until a point, um, but yeah, like I, I came in, started uh, as the starter for the year, and then um, 
was playing pretty well, had a few big games, a few good games, and our team was winning, which is the huge part. Like to get out, you, you don't want to be a guy putting up good numbers on a bad team who's losing. We were we were lucky enough to have a good group who kind of everyone contributed, and we we're kind of even spread across the board and then also we're picking up wins so that's kind of when coaches are going to come and look at you so yeah basketball was a lot more positive as well but then um, like I was I was unfortunate up like right before we were playing our rivals in our conference uh, game which which is a big game like we were I think we were ranked as high as third in Florida which is is a big feat like Florida Duke of basketball is probably the top state Florida and Texas would be the two top states so we were we were really, really playing good basketball and we're going into our game with our, our rival uh, college there. In, uh, they're probably about 40 minutes away from us in Ocala in Florida. We were in Gainesville and the training beforehand, uh, we're, so what, we're playing the Wednesday, Tuesday night training, I broke my finger and oh, kind of yeah, put everything a bit on hold and kind of took a bit of a setback. So like the excitement building up for that game, a big rivalry game, now there's going to be 50-odd coaches in the gym there watching it. It's a great chance to showcase what you can do and in a big game, like plenty of high-pressure situations, and just kind of showcase what you're capable of doing, which was taken away in a freak accident. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, miss, like, I'd, when it happened, I'd never broken anything before in my life, but heard the pop, um, was sure it was broke, went in. The athletic trainers had a look at it and was like, oh no, it's not broken, it's not broken. It was like, happy days. Yeah. I'm back out to try and play, practice again. Had it taped up, but I just was in far too much pain, like trying to catch, shoot, and even pass the ball like it was bad. So I ended up going to the hospital, getting an x ray, and turned out it was broke. So I was told I was going to be out for five weeks, which kind of just tore me apart. Now, like, that's essentially the season. So I yeah. thought the season was going to be done. And on that note, like, and had only been talking to colleges, didn't have any scholarship offers. So, like, breaks your heart saying, Jesus Christ, I worked that, like, that summer, changing your mentality, coming in, accepting it for what it is, putting together a good year, and then just for it to, for it to, to think it's going to end. But, like, was able to kind of nearly fill the doctors into let me back into playing. Like, was told to schedule, like, after I got the cast on, was told to schedule an appointment for five weeks' time to come back and get it off and was able to get an, an appointment to get it off in three weeks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, like, you have, to, you have to do it with desperation. Like, you have to do what you have to do to yeah. to get back playing. So and was your I finger grand? For, it was all right then after three oh, weeks? It was, it it was still it was still quite bad. Like it was still like not, I hadn't completely healed from the break, but like the pain I could deal with the pain then. Okay. And like that for me, that's like if I can, I don't mind a bit of pain as long as I can play through it, and it's not going to make something worse. Okay. So like kind of kind of grace mentality for me there, <laughs> but um, yeah, like I I had it had it strapped up, and I got back for our last two conference games. Okay. And and it came off the bench for them two games just kind of got back into the flow of things and then uh, we started the playoffs, like the, the playoff, the state tournament. Yeah. And was back starting again and had a few good games in the state, to, or the, like the playing tournaments for the state tournament and was able to kind of put things together again. So yeah, no, that was, that was, that was tricky. Like after, after a tough first year to have a second year go so smoothly um, and then for all of a sudden for it to just stop. So yeah, no, it was, it was, it was good and bad at the same time. Yeah, I can imagine how frustrating that was. And at the time, you were obviously talking to coaches, you had no offers. So when you got back into the starting lineup, were you talking to the same coaches? Did, did some of them kind of move away because you were injured? I suppose it's not a big injury, so they probably wouldn't have been too worried. Or No, like, it's, yeah, as you're saying, it wasn't a big injury. It's a, it's a break of a bone in your finger. Like, it heals quite quickly. And like yeah. obviously, when you come back, you're, you're, you're not, you haven't blown out your Achilles. Uh, anything like that it's not something that's going to drastically affect you it was my off shooting hand as well so like oh, it wasn't Grant. something that was going to yeah yeah it wasn't going to something that was going to change how I shot the ball and like that's honestly why I was recruited because of how I can shoot the ball okay and um so yeah like it wasn't going to drastically affect my game so yeah now coaches were coaches that I was talking to were still still interested and you ended up going to Longwood um I don't know if there was a connection to the Irish team I could be wrong there but who else were you talking to and what stood out with Longwood 
Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, so uh, coach Griff Aldrich, Griff was uh, he had just got the the head coach job. He was on the UMBC staff, uh, part of that team that beat uh, Virginia Deadly. in the sixteen one upset. So yeah, it was it was crazy. So yeah, uh, Griff got the job at Longwood and reached out to me then. Pete Schwedham, who was Paul Cummins' pal, had kind of put him in contact with me because Pete is living in Houston, Texas, and that's where Griff, Griff uh, is from as well. Okay. So, um, yeah, so Pete put Griff in contact with me and um, set up my visit. Um, we are going back and forth to text and everything, and as, as it goes with like college coach, you'll, you'll be texting them on and off, and then you won't hear from them for a week or two, and you don't know what's going to happen. So then I took a visit to a Division Two up in the northeast up near uh, Boston. So I took a visit there. They had offered me on my visit. So I think like, I knew it wasn't really somewhere where I was going to be happy and really want to go. Like I wanted to play Division One basketball. Okay. And then if I was going to play Division Two, I wanted to stay in Florida because the lifestyle is just a lot better. Like you have, you have the warm weather um, as opposed to dealing with the snow up in the northeast. Like today I took my visit up to, to Boston. Um, it was, well, it was probably... 25 degrees and sunny down in Florida and I landed and it's snowing up in Boston. I was like, oh, geez, I don't know if I can hack this now after yeah. after the, the last two years. Yeah. So um, then came back to, to college Santa Fe in Gainesville and then Griff was back in contact with me with Tex and he was at the Final Four. And yeah, from there we set up a visit to go visit Longwood up in Virginia. So I flew up um, to Virginia as soon as I kind of got off the plane, I had a bit of a laugh with the assistant coach, Cody, who's just one of the best guys in basketball. He, uh, I was wearing the UF of Florida hoodie, so the Florida Gator on it. Um, before Cody even shook my hand or anything, he's like, oh, I just want to make you aware I'm a UGA grad. So he, he was a Georgia grad, and Florida and Georgia would be two big rivals. So we had okay. a good bit of a laugh before that to kind of break the ice, settle in. And the rest of the visit went really, really well. Just kind of enjoyed the school. Um, just the scene, the scenes of the school as well. It was just a really, really nice campus. Um, basketball was kind of at the forefront of their plans going forward. It's a new coach coming in, new opportunity. Um, they're changing the way things are being done. And I just really wanted to be part of that. So that's kind of why I ended up going with Longwood. And what's that visit like um, and that whole like because you obviously see the campus and I'm sure you chat to the team and you kind of do a day and you probably stay over what's it like going through that yeah. what are the visits like um, I enjoyed it um, so flew in uh, got to the hotel you go into the hotel and they have your name tag uh, like on a lanyard with like a sign Sean Flood New Lancer and all this stuff they're just, they're just pitching at you like wanting wanting you to feel comfortable Yeah. Um, so then Went for dinner with the whole coach and staff. Well, before dinner, we went and done a presentation. So in the presentation, they're just showing like their style of play, okay. what they expect um, their team to play. Like, and this is a this is a brand new coaching staff. None of them have been there, yeah. except for Cody. So like it's a whole new regime. So they're showing you clips of UMBC because that's where Griff's coming from, trying to implement that 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 style of play and you've clips from their upset over Virginia like of course I want to be part of something like that yeah so um yeah we go and watch that and at the end there's like there's all the commitment like Sean Flood commitment loading like they're just bigging you up and everything so from there we went and had dinner and two of the boys from the team came to the dinner me and the coaches so it's a nice time to kind of sit and chat and see what the coaches are like away from basketball and just kind of have a chat, watch TV uh, in the sports bar or whatever, and then have a chat with some of the lads, just kind of see what their feelings are on on the place. Obviously, they didn't know the coach and staff, so just watch Farmville, like the places, there's stuff to do when you're not playing basketball. Um, then back to the hotel, and the next day, I uh, went and done like the campus visit, so that's when they took me around all the different academic buildings, then brought me into visit different like um people in the sporting offices so like i visited hannah she's our hannah ledger was our academic advisor so hannah was uh discussing like all the academics and your academic kind of expectations schedule, what that'll yeah. be like yeah mm-hmm. your expectations your your schedule what it would be like and what's expected of you in the classroom because you and, have like, to how do, they're going to help you you have to do time in like their study hall or something isn't it 
Uh, well, d- depends. University to university. Okay. Um, we had scheduled hours for study hall, but like if you had a certain GPA, you didn't have to be there. Oh, okay. Or if you're an upperclassman, if you're an upperclassman who they trusted to get your work done and all that, you didn't have to be there. Oh, okay. So like, yeah, Hannah, Hannah was basically like telling us all that stuff. Like, God, oh, this is what's expected of you. This is what your workload will be like, and just kind of letting you know there'll be people there to help you. Okay. So then after that, went and worked out with the team. Um. Like enjoyed the workout, had a good workout, and then sitting in the locker room after they offered me, and like just from how everything went, I was like, well, it'd be a fool not to take this. Yeah. So like obviously could have waited. Same situation, you can wait, and like someone else could have commit them before you, and then next thing you lose your scholarship. Yeah. Uh, opportunity. So I was like, well, I've liked the fit so far. I've liked everything about the place, and yeah. So like I'd be a fool to let someone else take that opportunity so I committed then on the visit rather than waiting to see what else would pop up very and uh, just yeah just went back from there went back to Gainesville a very happy person yeah I can imagine and as you mentioned there shooting was that like obviously that's one of your strengths shooting was the reason why they committed uh, they recruited you and do they talk about kind of your weaknesses I don't like that word but like something you have to improve on do they talk through Sean we want you here because you're shooting but we also need you to improve whether it's your defense or something else. Yeah, that's more of a conversation. Uh, weaknesses is when like you're on campus after you commit. I don't think okay. they want to bash yeah. you. Tell you, tell you not very Sean, good you're at. shit, but we want you. But, yeah, you may you may hit the nail on the head there talking about the defensive end. But um, yeah, like they Griff's whole thing going into that year was he wanted a lot of shooting. Okay. So um, he recruited me and a few other boys who were kind of like good shooters so that was kind of what he wanted to to build his team around and um, gone into his first year shooting is very important for the kind of offenses that he runs so um yeah like he, he he acknowledged that that's something that I was good at so that's what he wanted in his team good leader as well so um yeah it was a good opportunity and was happy to spend the two years there with him. And what's the division one standard like when you've played in Germany you've played for the Irish teams you've gone to junior college What's it like then making that step up to the highest level of college basketball? Um, honestly, I felt the jump from Ireland to Juco was a lot more difficult than the leap from Juco to Division One. Okay. Partly because uh, we played a lot more pick and roll, and kind of they they would the Americans would consider it a European style of basketball what we played at Longwood, but I wouldn't necessarily consider it a European style of basketball. Yeah. European sense in the sense that we were running pick and roll, but other than that it wasn't very European. Yeah. But um yeah, like it was it was a bit more comfort it was a bit more in my comfort zone in terms of what we were doing. And um yeah, the like the level of athlete goes up another little bit, but it's nothing like the jump from uh from Ireland to, to Florida to the Juco level. It was just that was that's unbelievable that uh, uh, leap. So yeah, no, it was a bit more comfortable. Okay, interesting. And I think did you play against Sean Jenkins in a game? Yeah, so Sean was actually he went to one of the other schools in the Big South. He went to Presbyterian. Uh, I think Sean's after transferring from there now. But yeah, yeah, Sean played. Sean played against me my senior year. That's pretty cool then, having two Irish lads on the court. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's ever been done before. Uh, two Irish lads playing against each other in a. Uh, NCAA Division One basketball, but yeah, it was was that like I I had very limited interactions with Sean previously, um, but yeah, it was definitely cool uh, to to see another Irish one out there, just kind of a bit weird. Yeah, like, oh Jesus, you're like me. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's more than just myself. And what's it like then? Yeah. So COVID hit, and then you were. Did you have? I obviously think the campus probably closed, and then you had to come back to Ireland. Did that, is that how it all worked? Yeah, a bit of a stinker with COVID. Um, so I was, I was grad. That was my senior year when COVID happened. Okay. So um, we had just lost in the quarterfinals of our conference tournament, and the way our conference tournament works, it's on our week of spring break. So we miss out on spring break, and then we get back, and we're in classes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Things all go normal. We're, obviously, there's whispers of this COVID yeah. thing is in America, and. It's only a matter of time before it makes its way to Virginia and makes its way to Farmville. So we're like, oh, whatever, like it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. So um, I remember I was I was taking a I was taking a test in one of the uh, professors' offices because I'd missed it for uh, being on a road game. So I'm sitting in his office taking the test. The doors open. 
on the door to one of the lecture halls open and I hear one of the professors saying, um, oh, I would expect the school, the school university to be shut down by the end of the week. I'm like, this fella's lost his head. Yeah. I was like, there's no way, there's no way, first of all, that they're going to shut the school down if it happens. And then there's no way it's, it's getting here in a week. Um, so this is a Wednesday and then and it was shut down to Thursday. I remember I was supervising, I was, I was entrusted with uh, by Hannah to, to supervise study hall. So I'm supervising study hall. <laughs> oh, yeah, the hall. tables have turned. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So I'm sat there supervising study hall, uh, watching a game on my iPad. That's that's the game. I think it was the OKC game yeah. where the, uh, Rudy Gobert got COVID. And it was, oh, it was mad. So the Dallas game is on and that, it's about to finish and the other game's about to start and then the commentators talk about Season this mad cancelled. stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, in Oklahoma. So then um I get home and we all get an email saying, Yeah, like school is cancelled from Thursday till next Wednesday. So us being college students who've just missed out on spring break are all delighted, like, oh happy days. Yeah. This is this is our spring break now, we'll go off and I'll go somewhere we all do something mad for a week yeah. and come back and everything be normal. Like it's just all right. Well, our, week, our spring break is just delayed a week, and everyone come back from the spring break is thinking, oh, we'll just extend our spring break a week. Yeah. Then um, the Wednesday comes and it's definitely very obvious that this is a bigger deal than we all thought it was. Yeah. Um, they're like yeah, so we're closed for another two weeks. Like and two more weeks off, and then two weeks comes and tell that's it. Like all class will just be online. So obviously I had the option then to just come home. But I didn't want to. Like, I have a girlfriend over there, I still do. Okay. So I was like, um, well, I was like, I don't want to leave her. I want to, like, push that, like, push that goodbye out as far as possible. Yeah. Um, and uh, I also wanted to finish what I started over there. Like, so I wanted to finish out all my classes over there. Yeah. So um, I stuck, I, a lot of my teammates had left. And um, one of my teammates, he was actually my roommate, one of my best pals there as well. Um, he had gone down to Fort Lauderdale, Miami, where his dad lived. So he'd gone down there um, for the little short break. And then when he got back, we ended up having to quarantine because if you cross state lines, you had to quarantine. So I, that meant we were, stuck, we were stuck in the apartment, we weren't allowed to leave. So I was ready to kill him because every day I was going over to the gym, yeah. able to work out. And then next thing I'm hit with this, I'm not allowed to leave the apartment. Like you're not allowed to leave the front door. Yeah. Um, foods dropped at your door three times a day so like it just Jesus. stuck in the apartment yeah. but um, yeah like so I, I was like right well I'm not I'm not going home there's something I'm here to do so then yeah it's finished classes stayed I think probably a week after gra- I was still there the day I was supposed to graduate and just ghost down no, no one's around like so yeah it was it was definitely kind of put a bit put a bit of a, bit of da- a dampener on finishing college like normally as a senior, when you when you play your last game or whatever, you just turn into a regular student. Then yeah, I was looking forward to kind of that that life as well. Just the this no more freedom and like more free time that you have. So obviously, working to be a professional like that's your goal. So you you know you have to stay on top of things. But it's just that little bit more relaxed that you yeah. don't have to be at a training session. That if I wanted to just take a day off or if I wanted to just go out with the the lads one night. Like, and uh, just not not wake up and go to train the next day. I I have that comfort level. So kind of the the good part of that of being a regular college student, I missed out on for the last probably three months of yeah. college. But yeah. yeah, it was a bit of a dampener. And no graduation ceremony was pretty. I was going to say well. yeah, especially in America, they make like literally such a big deal of it. It looks like a nearly a festival yeah. what they do. That's a pity. Oh, and like. We have we have a, in at Longwood I'm sure they do at other schools we have a thing called senior week so basically like everyone's parents and that was there and all the seniors and there's different events leading up oh. to the graduation ceremony at the yeah. weekend and it's supposed to be a great laugh um so I missed out on senior week and then obviously the graduation ceremony they they have it outside on like uh, it's, called, it's called Wheeler Mall like it's a bit nice real nice lawn and that time of the year the weather's beautiful in Virginia nice sun yeah. Um, not too hot so like it's they do it up really really nice and yeah just missed out on that like so it's it's a bit of a bummer like going through four years of college to not get to walk across the stage and be handed your diploma with your 
your mum and dad sitting there is a bit rough, but yeah. like you still have the degree. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's look, it's a pity. Unfortunately, you didn't get it. Um, but you mentioned there, like actually, I want to ask about from the conversation. Let's say when they talked about your strengths and weaknesses, if they were to repeat that conversation at the end of your two years at Longwood, would the the characteristics or elements of your game on the weaker side moved over to the strong side? Is that something, like, what do you feel you really improved at, at Longwood? Um, I wouldn't say I turned a strength into, a weakness into a strength, but I'd say I probably made it less weaker. Okay. Um, yeah, just, like, when, when you, you've, obviously, everyone has weaknesses in everything they do, be yeah. it a basketball player, football player, especially as an athlete, it's something you're never going to be a perfect athlete. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's something I worked on and kind of progressed over over the two years that I was there. And like they're they're good at kind of holding you accountable as to like what you need to get better at. So yeah, I feel I improved over over my course, my two years there. And like one thing I remember Griff saying to us, um, Tony Bennett, the UVA coach, used to say to he asked us. Um, Griff said this was he asked us when we came back from um, like our, our break. We got home for six weeks or four weeks in the summer before our summer school starts. And he said, well, the, the player you are this year, or the player you are this year should dominate the player you were last year. That and was... that's something that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of something that's stuck with me now since. And it's something that I will often reflect on. Like, all right, like, what, how was I as a player this time last year? And I definitely feel the player I left Longwood as would dominate the player I came into Longwood as. So I think over the course of the two years, I've probably, probably done my job. Yeah, brilliant. I also loved his quote, uh, what we do in the dark will reel itself in the light. I think you had that on the, the Hoop Folio podcast. Oh, Jesus. Sick <laughs> of hearing this like, You're like, go away, or I don't want to hear it. Uh, sick of hearing that and sick of hearing focus and effort. I don't think I ever want to hear them two words put together ever again. Oh. Nah, but it, it's good. Like it, it, it's, it's it's doing its job. Like He it, it lets us know like that, that's what he wants from you. And the repetition bores you, kills you. Yeah. to death but um yeah yeah like it's it's in big huge like when you walk out of our locker room door there's the big focus and effort and then like the last thing you see i think i think it's not if you do the marines quote like um yeah is it the no the marines quote you sink to your level but uh yeah i think it's aristotle or someone uh watch the under dark revealed itself in the light but yeah that was plastered on our uh in our locker room as well so you see all these things all the time and it nearly haunts you yeah yeah i'd say so and so you t- yeah obviously a good quote yeah it is yeah it's, it's good but i'd say you're, you're sick to death but you left longwood then you had the summer i uh, you obviously did have aspirations to go professional probably from a young age and then kind of when you're in the states you're like right i really have a good shot at this um you didn't go to germany until like november time was it or do i have that timeline wrong uh, I got yeah I got the end of October so I the contract stuff had started like the talk of between my agent and the club had started in the middle of September yeah and we we're hoping to have it all wrapped up and be over there in the September start of October to get uh, like a very condensed preseason to then start the season but with COVID there was all kinds of different problems that we were encountering trying to get the contract signed. Mm-hmm. And then Ireland was on the red list or something, and then trying to get over there was a bit of a nightmare. But um, no, we worked hard in the end, and we were able to get it done. So we arrived over there. I think it was what's it, the 30th of October, the 29th of October. Had to quarantine for uh, a couple of days in a hotel until my uh, COVID test came back negative. But I ended up missing the first game of the season. I wasn't even in Germany for it. And then the second game of the season, I was sitting down watching because I still hadn't officially signed okay. or anything wasn't cleared by the league so um then i was able to kind of put pen to paper get everything properly moving and um, get everything sealed off properly and was able to play down the next week so Brilliant. yeah it was it was a bit it was a bit of a bit of a mess because of covid but um no, it turned out to be a good move for me yeah and how did you find going from junior college wise and um, Longwood obviously you have classes you have other commitments what's it like then becoming a professional and knowing this is your full-time job and you don't have to take up your time with the academic side or with other commitments you, you just know I'm in Germany to play basketball uh, it's, it's good it's it's the it's a change like not only do you have classes but like you have so much friends, you have so many pals, you have so many different things to do when you're in college. The whole atmosphere of a college town is fantastic. It's, it's unbelievable, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it changes then going into being a professional. So right, basketball is now my job at town, getting paid. 
So um, yeah, during the day you have to kind of instead of going to class or anything, you're you're taking a nap, you're recovering, you're doing farm rolling, you're doing your mobility stuff, you're doing your stretching. Um, as opposed, you're so you're fill, you're still filling up them hours. Like it's not as if you're just sat there bored. Yeah. Um, and but yeah, there's obviously times where you you sat there. Like, this is what I do to be surrounded by my pals back in Farmville again, like some of my teammates. Uh, obviously my girlfriend yeah. just like to be able to do small things like that like it's you miss um but yeah it's 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 good it's what you've dreamed of like oh, I want to be a professional basketball player now I'm living it so you have to kind of treat it appropriately yeah you did really well in your first year how did you find uh that professional like that standard of in Germany I think it was the third league was it or I could be wrong yeah, yeah, no, it was a third league, probably in Germany. Yeah, it was it was a good standard, same thing. Like the level of professionalism was was very good. Like you have teams practicing five days a week, five nights a week. Like and we practice as a team. We'd have five nights a week as a team, but then also me and probably it would change day to day. But we could have like six lads in in the morning Brilliant. at a morning session. Like I I was in every day, regardless of me and a few of the others. But like. Um, the morning session would then depend on who was available. So some of the boys were still in college over there. So um, depending on class schedule, who could make it or not. So yeah, like it's just the, the professionalism uh, of, of your team, the professionalism with the other teams, like players are getting paid, coaches are getting paid, and like they have the aspirations to move up to the second league and then hopefully then push to move on. Like the, there's different tiers to it and like everyone's trying to progress through it. Yeah. So um yeah like the level of professionalism I'd say is something that really differs from from basketball back home in Ireland. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to the um ch- European championships. I'm just conscious of time. I've kept you for long enough. But talk us through those. No, no worries. Talk us through those championships. They're at home. Fortunately, no spectators. We don't get into that. That's a whole podcast in itself. Oh, yeah, but and you, you were in the bubble, weren't you? In the Louis Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald or something? Yeah, we're in. Yeah, we're in the Louis Fitz. <laughs> the uh, do- the NBA like- bubble of Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Very secure as well. The Louis Fitz definitely didn't see boys in uh, in Joel's or over in the Circle K grabbing coffee. None of our team. We were we were very very good. We uh, we like we we understood that like the expectations we had set for ourselves was to win, and we didn't want to do anything to hinder those expectations. We kind of held ourselves to to a good level of accountability. Like knowing that right. Well, listen, if one of the boys goes over to Jericho okay just to grab a coffee or a chocolate bar or something stupid and then next thing they're kicked out of the tournament because they've breached the bubble yeah like it's 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 silly yeah so um yeah now we we were like right well we're, we're there with a job to do and we we knew what we needed to get done and um yeah like we went into the tournament knowing where we, we should essentially win the gone medal we're talented enough as a team we have enough uh we have everything that we need as a team like Position wise, player wise, skill set wise, offensively, defensively. So um, yeah, now we went in with our high expectations and kind of just made the most of the bubble situation there uh, in the Louis Fifth. Yeah, you were. I was really impressed. I was at the tournament and I was actually. I remember watching the games on the the. Well, I'd watched the ones online, but the the games on the Saturday and the Sunday. And I think it did happen the other two days. But at one stage, there was five is on the court, obviously, and there was four. Division one former or current star uh, players like CJ was uh, was playing. Obviously, he's going to Lafayette this year. But yourself, Jordan and John as well were on the court. That just shows, I think, the level of basketball in Ireland has just risen. Like, if ten years ago, I don't think that would have been a reality. Oh, absolutely, like, no way at all. Like we, yeah, we started four Division one guys and the fifth one is Lockout. Like, yeah, well, and he's a pro. Like, if you think about it, like he is. Like, the stuff that Larko does just blows your mind. Like, I've seen Larko play since he's 17, 16, 17. Yeah. The stuff he does now, I'm still like, what is this? Like, <laughs> how is he doing? Like, it's mental. Yeah. So, yeah, we start with more division guys in Larko who could easily play at a high level. Yeah. Higher level. So, yeah, no, like, as you're saying, 10 years ago, that was completely unimaginable. I don't think we would have had four guys... Um, play division one. I know we had um, Mike Bree, Connor Grace, and then after that, I think the list is uh, Jason, obviously, as well. Jesus, yeah. Paul Cummins. But yeah, after that, the list is fairly short. So um, yeah, 10 years ago, it was unimaginable. Hopefully, now in another 10, um, it'll just kind of be the norm. Yeah. 
turn away Division One lads from from the team. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And something I was really impressed with as well. I was up in the in the bleachers watching the games, but off the court when you were on the bench, something I really noticed was your leadership. Was that something you've always been good at? Were you a natural leader, or was that something you really had to work on? Personally, or as a team? Yourself. And um, no, yeah, I like to think I was a I was a good leader all along. Like you just have to kind of find the niche of of the team and know what like what what's needed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I like to consider myself a leader. Like the, the position I play kind of demands leadership as a point guard. Um, but yeah, like we we had a we had a good a good talented team. So we just kind of know what needs needs to be done, what needs to be said at different different times. Like we had some. Uh, we had some mad personalities on that team. Yeah. Some angry men. So, yeah. Uh, just trying to keep everyone happy now and what needs to be said yeah. at different times. But, uh, you know, like, I think it was a good group as well, a good group of lads. Like, we all got on well, yeah. which kind of meant to, to chat to lads. Like, listen, you're, you're a bit out of line. You need to reel it back or whatever. But, like, that, that probably goes back to the whole summer we spent together working hard in the arena twice a week yeah. and we got closer to the tournament three four times a week and then the, the laugh we were having in the hotel playing ping pong and all it just kind of brought us all together so yeah as a leader it makes it makes that job so much easier when you have a good group of boys like that if there's any younger players listening that maybe struggle with confidence or leadership or sorry, communication rather than confidence. Um, is there any advice that you would give, particularly the younger players that struggle with that? Is there anything you could tell them? Uh, like you have to own it. Like it's it's a part of the game. Coaches here, coaches in the states, coaches in Ireland, that all say like you can be shy off the court. They don't care who you are, but as soon as you cross the line, you need to you need to like not be shy. You need to adopt a different persona, and that's completely true. Like off the court, I'm not, I'm not a shy person. Yeah, but I wouldn't. A mad loud person, quite calm, but um, like yeah, you have to be loud. You have to be a lady. You have to like, be confident. Like it's no one's gonna look at you funny, and if they do look at you funny for being loud, like it's while you're playing your sport, and like being a leader, that that's their problem. Yeah. Like Jesus, if you're taking it too serious, like that's that's their problem. That's not your problem, especially if if it's at an elite level. Like that's 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 a damn problem, not a you problem. Yeah. So yeah, don't just own it, own into it, like. Someone, someone has to lead, someone has to follow. So, so be that guy, step forward. Be that girl, step forward. Take, take ownership of it. Brilliant. I was at the arena, as I said. After he has won, I can't count how many times someone was like whooping. I think oh. I <laughs> the noise oh. he's made. You'd actually think there was fans in the arena. You were so loud. We were so happy. Like it, we had said at the start of the summer saying what we wanted to do. And then like... To kind of like during during the tournament, we realised that like all right, this standard's not too high. We're we're by far the best team here. We're gonna accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah. But we we're gonna hold ourselves to that gold standard. We we're talking about gold medal. Like we want to hold ourselves to the gold standard, knowing that further down the line, this isn't the competition we want to play. This wasn't our end goal. Yeah. This was. Um, before that brief moment, that was our end goal. And, what we'd set out to do, we were able to do. So we were absolutely delighted. And it wasn't something that had been done before any any time recently. We had we'd not medaled in our first time back in the championships then to get a bronze medal. So to kind of break that barrier, take a step forward and really put the pressure on basketball Ireland and the EPC to put us into the Eurobasket qualifiers, you kind of realised what we had done and we were just uh, overjoyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah about not having the fans there we just oh, to have the fans would have been absolutely phenomenal like just the energy like the text we'd get from like not just me the text the boys would all get from family members watching it and friends everyone was just saying we wish we, we could have been there we honestly do like we would have loved nothing more than for it to be two and a half thousand people in the arena and mm-hmm. uh, just kind of experiencing that with us but yeah now it's it's definitely something going forward I, I think it's kind of added a little bit of an appetite for people to get in the arena and see the product that we're putting out on the court. definitely looking towards the future there you mentioned the Eurobasket what can we expect from the Irish senior men's team over the next five years um five years jeez that's so a very long time now I'm asking you yeah, well Definitely progression. Like you, as you said, ten years ago, basketball was at a certain point in Ireland where we wouldn't have had 
four division one one lads on the court at a time and I'd say over the next five years we can expect instead of going from four division one boys on the court we can go and have six seven eight professionals on the court like full-time professionals like we had Adrian John me Jordan who had all that season had played professional basketball so I think that number can then go up to seven eight with division one boys coming in shaking things up like it's it's I think the next five years is, is really exciting time for us well obviously a great opportunity now starting in November for us to kind of set the tone and then um, and just kind of yeah lay the groundwork for for them years going forward obviously it's, we've been, we've been quite a tough group in drawing Switzerland, mm-hmm. Austria and Cyprus. But uh, it's, it's a challenge we're more than happy to accept and kind of meet head on and just kind of, um, yeah, just attack it. Like, we're, we're not going to be scared going into the game. So, like, we're really looking forward to it, really eager for it. So, I mm-hmm. think over the next five years, we can really see see a progression going forward and kind of get into the later stages of qualifiers and hopefully then eventually make it the Eurobasket. Mm-hmm. For yourself, over the next couple of years, you're playing professionally. Where do you hope? Where do you see yourself? Where do you hope to be uh, over the next couple of years? Um, like I'm playing, so this year I'm playing the top league in Cyprus. So um, decent league as well. Like there's a FIBA Europe Cup and the Basketball Champions League team uh, at the top of the league. So like over the next few years, I want to progress to play in the FIBA Europe Cup Basketball Champions League, one of them uh, European competitions, if if lucky. Um, but also just playing playing the top leagues in Europe, be that in in uh, what's it like Germany, France, Spain. Like obviously, it's tough, tough goal, tough place to be. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely something that I want to do, and it's uh, like I'll definitely put my mind and whatever it takes to get done. If, if I'm lucky enough, I'll, I'll be able to achieve that. So yeah, that's kind of my my goal over the next couple of years. Basketball was. It's hard to kind of think so far ahead, but eventually, when you do retire, because sport doesn't last forever, unfortunately. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh, what do I want to be remembered for? Jesus, that's a tough <laughs> We're going deep with these. <laughs> I'm not normally a deep thinker. I'm just very on the surface. Um, geez, what do I want to be remembered for? I suppose one of, the, one of the best Irish players ever, one of the best Irish point guards ever, someone who's kind of set a tone and, and led a way for, uh, for generations to follow and kind of see if teams can not only replicate but kind of push on from the stuff that, that I've set uh, down as a marker and what other teammates have set down as a marker I'd say probably Brilliant I know you have a lot of younger players looking up to you what do you think is the most underrated skill in the game? Oof Jesus these are deep questions um, underrated skill in the game uh, I'd say timing Okay Like being able to do things not at 100 miles an hour it doesn't have to be but like with precise timing like if you can like set a screen at a right time or be in the right place at the right time on defensively on the defensive end sorry um caught at the right time uh, like be able to get the ball from the point to the wing the same time a cross screens happens at a wing the big can just catch and finish yeah be able to pass in time i'd say time would probably be the, uh, the most of the right skill Speaking of time, uh, I asked Puff Summers for a question and he asked, he wanted to know how often do you actually think of the game? Like in the in the 24 hours, obviously you're asleep for some of them. How often are you thinking about basketball, whether it's visualisation, you're thinking about, as you mentioned before, tactics, videos, podcasts. How often is it? Oh man, an unhealthy amount. Um, 24 hours in a day, I try to sleep for eight of them. What's that? 16? Yeah. 16. The full sixteen. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Wow. I, I would I would definitely think about basketball at least once an hour. That is probably even in my sleep. I dream about basketball. Like I'll think about a dream, or sometimes I'll go about like thinking of something to do with a basketball game. Yeah. Like if we lose, if we lose a game, forget about sleep. Like just constantly on my mind. But yeah, like every waking hour, I definitely think about basketball. Watch a basketball be it on on the phone. Like I love to watch games, so I'm watching. I watch Romanian basketball league. I watch right. the Belgian game. Be it international, like I watch under eighteen, under sixteen games. I just watch all kinds of basketball. 
Is there any specific player you like to watch or sort of model your game around? Steve Nash, he would be my favourite player. I think like his game wasn't the quickest, wasn't the biggest, wasn't the strongest, most athletic. Yeah. But uh, very disciplined in his skill, knew what he was good at, knew what he wasn't good at. Okay. And uh, strength, shot the ball well. So yeah, Steve Nash would be kind of my, say, role model basketball wise. Very good. So we're going to move on to slot line seven. It's the same seven questions at the end of every podcast. Question one, what is your favourite quote? Favourite quote? Uh, so I'm a big perfectionist um, and it gets me in a lot of trouble a lot of times. Okay. I can get quite frustrated if things aren't perfect, like basketball-wise, not basketball-wise. Uh, but I have to constantly remind myself that perfection is something that like you're always chasing. It's never never going to be quite there so I'd say my favourite quote would be progress of perfection Very good. As, long as, as long as we're progressing towards perfection that everything's, everything's sweet everything's over Very good there's also a good quote I think it's about perfection if we aim for perfection we, we reach excellence so you can never actually be perfect and it's just a reminder to yourself like as you said just keep progressing don't get so perfectionist Yeah don't get caught up in it yeah. which I do probably down to my dad <laughs> You blame him. If he's listening, he'll be on to you now. Uh, best sporting event you've been to? Best sporting event. I mean, probably my favourite would be going off to Old Trafford to see United. Okay. And obviously Ronaldo scored an absolute scorch of a free kick. Yeah. So hopefully it'll be something similar now this yeah. season. So I've not been at Champions League finals or... Uh, basketball, Euro, Euro League finals or anything like that. Been at a few NBA games, but uh, I'd know my first love was Manchester United as a sport team, so I'd say I'd love to watch Manchester United play. Brilliant. Is there any particular standout moment for you as individually? Uh, seeing Ronaldo score that peach and free kick would be... Like nothing? Or, it would like something you're involved in? Oh, uh, playing. Um, I would say winning the... Uh, Obviously, to Jesus Christ, the Euros just gone by. That's up there. And then also winning the National Cup, Temple Oaks first National Cup, Senior National Cup with uh, the boys right before I headed off to America. I think it was 2016, 2015. Okay. Really, uh, that was great. Packed arena. And it's been a club that I was with since I was six, seven. So, yeah, to progress all the way from the academy to the senior team to be the starting guard on that team. It was, that, was, that was very special. It's pretty cool. Uh, biggest setback or challenge so far in your career? I'd say breaking my finger at an important time of uh, my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. When team was starting to hot up, which was kind of left me in a bad place for a little while in terms of not knowing what I was going to be able to do. Was I going to get back? Was I going to get looks? Was I going to have a place to go next year? So yeah, that was probably probably the biggest setback at the moment. On the flip side, a bit more positive, uh, what's your biggest achievement on or off the court? Uh, playing with Ireland always is huge honour, uh, but then off the court, I would say graduating college. Very good. Uh, advice your eighteen-year-old self. <laughs> do, do your mobility work. So, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, probably that probably be you know, self. But yeah, um, yeah, do your mobility work. Stay on top of your body, and um, your body is such an important part of being an athlete, and it's it's all you have. So um, yeah, stay on top of your your work. And then obviously strength and conditioning so is so key too. Brilliant. Um, I actually I quoted something out there. You said in the basketball Ireland interview, take setbacks as they come, but be stubborn enough to not accept them for reaching your ultimate goal. That seems to be when you talk about your finger and a couple of other things. That seems to really be your stubbornness nearly goes to your advantage there. Oh, I'm so stubborn. Like be it basketball or just off the like away from basketball, I'm a stubborn. I'm a stubborn individual. Yeah. But, uh, you know, absolutely, you have to be stubborn. Like, people are going to say no, but that means they're saying no. Someone else might not say no. But they're saying no right then. They may not say no. Like, if Griff saw me, Griff had got that long wood job when I was 18, coming out, of, coming out of college, he could have said no. But then the work you do two years later, he may not say no then. So, uh, yeah, no, you have to be stubborn. Very good. Uh, dream dinner guest and why? And you can pick a few for this one if you want. Oh, okay, non basketball, I would probably say Mark Cuban. Well, basketball, non basketball. Yeah. Um, I love business. Um, I studied business and marketing in college. Very good. Uh, so I'd say Mark Cuban. His episode with JJ Reddick was very good. I was only listening back to it today. 
Yeah, JJ's pod is very good. And like, yeah, I love that one. Also, like, obviously, stinking rich. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, he's, he's good. Like, he's good at everything he does. Like, Shark Tank is a great TV show I like to watch. Um, obviously, has had success with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, and then, obviously, multiple other businesses that's successful. So, it's like Mark Cuban for the whole business aspect and just kind of what he's done in life to be successful. Um, basketball would be Steve Nash, obviously, after saying it's a, a player I admire. Yeah. Um, football, Cristiano Ronaldo. The, um, and then I suppose the missus and parents would, would have to be there as well, wouldn't they? Yeah, very good. Uh, final question before I let you go. If your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? Uh, trending upwards. Okay, so we've big thing to expect now. Uh, I hope so. I mean, I feel I'm on a trajectory of kind of like the league I was in last year. This league's a bit better, and um, like better like standard of basketball at the top of the league. Like if teams playing in the FIBA are playing the basketball Champions League, yeah, which is my level of basketball. So, um, yeah, that's that's a new challenge for me. So it's it's trending in the right direction. Hopefully, we can keep it going that way. Brilliant. Sean, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for your time. I just want to wish you the very best of luck next year and looking forward to keeping in touch and looking forward to the Eurobasket qualifi- qualifiers in November. See, we actually, our first game is against Cyprus over here. So oh, brilliant. The, is, like, the arena that they play in is literally a minute, two minutes away from my apartment here. So Brilliant. And I can't wait for that. It'll be a good start. Good start for us. Definitely. Perfect, Sean. Thanks a million for your time. Thanks, Orla. A massive thank you to Sean for joining me today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I hope you got something from it. I'll be sure to leave all of Sean's social media links in the description box below and I just want to wish him the very best of luck moving forward. If you did enjoy the episode, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review over an Apple podcast as it does help the show grow. And don't forget to check out the brand new website, thesidelinelive.com for more. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.